Tonight, we have a special guest speaker. He is uh, Chris Hedges. <coughs> he is not just an award-winning author, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning author that's with us tonight. He is a columnist, currently a columnist for Truth Dig, and most importantly, he is an activist for social change. Chris Hedges has written 12 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, which he co-authored with the cartoonist Joe Sacco. Some of his other books include Death of the Liberal Class, Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, I Don't Believe in Atheists, and the best-selling American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America. His book, War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction. In 2011, Nation Books published a collection of Hedges' truth dig columns called The World As It Is, Dispatches on the Myth of Human Progress. Now, I might also add, and I know some of you will find this surprising, Chris Hedges was ordained as a minister on Sunday. He is the Reverend <laughs> Hedges. And tonight, he is going to address the topic, police brutality, mass incarceration, resistance, and social transformation. Let's give a warm POP welcome to Chris Hedges. And he is a member of the People's Organization for Progress. A dues paying member. Not just a member. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about a little bit about the prison system itself. Um, well, there are certainly some people in the room who know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, but I've taught for many years in uh, several prisons in Trenton. Were you in Trenton? Yes. Yeah, I, just taught, I, taught, I taught all summer there. Yeah. And uh, Rahway, where I've taught for a while, a couple years, and Wagner. Um, and in the course of that teaching, and I, when I was, I was a seminary graduate, by the way, uh, 31 years ago, uh, and uh, was 20 years overseas. Uh, and when I came back to the United States, I'd spent 20 years in, develop, in the developing countries in Latin America, in the Middle East, much of that time in places like Gaza. Uh, covered the war in the former Yugoslavia for three years, was in Sarajevo during the war, Kosovo. Um, and when I came back to the United States, uh, just as I had been overseas in communities of severe oppression, and in many cases oppression uh, directed by uh, the United States, that was certainly true in places like Gaza or in Central America, um, I sought out uh, marginal communities that were suffering from uh, the effects of empire internally. Uh, and in my last book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, which I wrote with the cartoonist Joe Sacco, uh, and I'll tell you why I did it with a cartoonist, uh, we went to the poorest pockets of the United States, the sacrifice zones, um, these places where uh, whole communities have been rendered invisible uh, to the wider society. Uh, so we went, spent many weeks in Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States, and we were there uh, per capita the most dangerous. Uh, we were in the coal fields of southern West Virginia. Uh, we were in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, uh, Lakota Sioux Indian Reservation, where the average life expectancy is 48. That is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of 80. At any one time, on Pine Ridge, 60% uh, of the population have neither running water or electricity. That's America. Yeah. And then uh, the produce fields, and we went to Florida because the labor laws are the most draconian in the country as opposed to California. For example, in Florida, while collective bargaining is technically legal, uh, a uh, 
large agribusiness can fire their workers if they find that they are attempting to actually organize with no legal ramifications. Now, the reason we went to these sacrifice zones, as we call them, these places where people have been utterly disempowered, their environments have been poisoned and destroyed, um, they have virtually no protection under the law. Indeed, the law essentially works as an instrument of oppression uh, is because we wanted to give readers uh, an idea of what unfettered, unregulated capitalism looks like, what it does when it has no control. And as Karl Marx understood, unfettered, unregulated capitalism is a revolutionary force. It has no internal limits. It will turn everything into commodities. Human beings become commodities. The natural world becomes a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And the reason I did it with Sacco, uh, who, I know some people have mentioned Gaza, by the way. Uh, Footnotes in Gaza is one of the great books on the Palestine-Israel conflict. Six years he worked on it. Uh, and if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, it's a graphic novel, but it's, he's a great reporter. He just draws it out. Uh, and the reason I wanted to work with Joe is because uh, I know that we don't see these people. These people are never shown. The only time poor people are ever shown in the mass media is when we ridicule them on Jerry Springer. We make fun of them. Um, uh, that's the only time they ever appear on the mass media. All their, their dignity, their struggle, uh, their oppression, none of that is ever captured by the commercial media. Poor people are just the butt of the joke. Uh, they're, they're the butt of jokes of the commercial media. And so we wanted to draw it out so that people could visually see what the wider culture never shows them. That it wasn't just r about reporting, it was about, uh, a about showing their faces, showing their landscapes. Uh, and one of the things you can do in comic panels that you can't do uh, in photographs is you can recreate a history. So for instance, we interviewed uh, a 92-year-old coal miner uh, who had begun, like many people, working in the mines uh, right after his father was killed in a mine accident in the 30s. This was before unions, before the mines uh, were mechanized, um, and, and trace his life. The only time he ever left West Virginia was when he was drafted in the Army in World War II, and he was wounded in the Battle of the Bulge. When we met him, he was dying a black lung. Um, very few miners, all, all miners who spend significant amounts of time in the mines get black lung, uh, very few lived to 92. Um, uh, he'd been fighting black lung for 20 years. But it was a way to take panels and just show his life. We did that with a woman in Camden uh, with her life as well. Um, so you could not only tell the story, uh, but you give people a visual image of that story. The reason we wanted to write about those sacrifice zones uh, is because now the whole country's become a sacrifice zone. Um, that what's happened in these places uh, is now happening everywhere. Uh, and increasingly, uh, it, it's turned from an assault against poor people within pockets uh, to poor people across the country, working people across the country, and increase, increasingly um, the white middle class, uh, which is beginning for the first time to feel the kind of effects of repression uh, that uh, marginal people, uh, people who've lived in marginal communities, especially people of color, have felt for decades. And that was, of course, one of the impetus behind the Occupy movement. These, in essence, were the sons, white, largely white sons and daughters of the middle class who um, suddenly confronted police brutality. It was a big surprise, of course, to them that there was police brutality. Uh, suddenly confronted the fact that they couldn't get meaningful work. Uh, suddenly confronted issues like foreclosures, bank repossessions. Uh, and this is something that I fault especially the white liberal class for, and I wrote a book called Death of the Liberal Class that talks a lot about this, where the white liberal class, and this was essentially orchestrated by figures like Clinton out of the Democratic Party, is uh, they busy themselves with a kind of boutique activism, uh, multiculturalism, gender, all, not none of which I'm against, I all support, but what they did is essentially forgot the fundamental issue of justice. So while, while the poor and working men and women in this country uh, were being essentially stripped, of any power to defend themselves and any power to earn a living, uh, that white liberal class was busying itself with other issues and turning their backs on them. Uh, and that, of course, was a fatal mistake because once they finished with uh, the poor and the working class, um, they have turned on, on, on that segment of 
uh, of the white middle class as well. Um, one of the main instruments, um, and I don't have to tell anyone in pop this, but one of the main instruments of social control uh, became, of course, mass incarceration and the use of uh, the drug laws, the excuse of drug laws, uh, by which uh, uh, especially poor men of color whose bodies were worth nothing on the streets of Newark um, behind bars is suddenly worth forty or fifty thousand dollars to phone companies and I just tried to sell to a common send money to a friend of mine through a commissary and um, you know they p passed it all now to this private company so if you if you send twenty bucks they, they want a five they want five dollars uh, you know every single way that they can gouge the poor if you want in Rahway if you the prison in Rahway if you want if a relative of yours dies um, you have uh, you can go either to uh, either have a deathbed visit or the wake for 15 minutes but they charge you eight hundred dollars did you know that eight hundred dollars and if you're earning a dollar a day think how long it takes to pay off eight hundred dollars you pay that $800 for those two guards to go shackled for 15 minutes. You've got to pay them $800. Um, this is something that undocumented workers are experiencing. I mean, ICE just uses undocumented workers like an ATM machine um, uh, because they have zero rights. And so they will pick them up for fines that if you are a citizen, you may, might not even have a fine, but they have a whole different fine system. Um, and these are some of the poorest people in the country. $1,000 for, you know, driving without a license, whatever it is. Um, and they're going to be deported, but they just, they, grab, they, they kind of loot as much money as they can from them uh, on the way out the door. Um, now, what, what is it that we've created, essentially through these, uh, the power to create police forces uh, in cities like Newark, Camden, wherever it is, that are omnipotent. By omnipotent, <coughs> meaning they have essentially been given the legal right to serve as judge, jury, and executioner. Mm. There's a political philosopher I like very much named Hannah Arendt, <coughs> who writes or in her book, Origins of Totalitarianism, about precisely this issue. Now, she had fled Nazi Germany as a Jew uh, to France. And once she fled Nazi Germany, she was stripped of her German citizenship, so she became on the uh, eve of World War II, that large group of people who were defined as stateless, meaning they had no legal documents, in the same way that undocumented workers in this country are stateless, and therefore uh, the, the, the systems of authority, and in particular the judicial systems and the systems of law enforcement can do whatever they want with them. Um, so she wrote about, about what, what happened when you create these omnipotent policing forces that are able to prey on groups of people who essentially have been stripped of their rights, either because they're poor and they live in communities like Newark or because they're undocumented. And she said that what happens is that once you create the physical mechanism of omnipotent policing, the ability of the police, as you all know, to kick down your doors in the middle of the night, uh, supposedly delivering a warrant for a nonviolent offense, um, that uh, that, when it's twinned with the corruption of the legal system, uh, essentially becomes a recipe for totalitarianism. So what we've seen over the last few years is an evisceration of our most basic constitutional rights. Um, wholesale surveillance, everybody in this room, uh, every form of electronic communication we have is captured, downloaded, and stored by the government. Um, we are the most photographed, monitored, watched, eavesdropped population in human history. Yeah. And I covered the uh, East German state, the Stasi. I, I covered it as a reporter. I covered the collapse of East Germany uh, and the kinds of things that the state is able to do to us now. Uh, the Stasi never even dreamt of. Wow. And all of this stuff is stored in perpetuity in government computers. Why? And again, we go back to a writer on totalitarianism like Aaron, and she said that in totalitarian systems, the reason they take and capture all of your information and store it uh, is not essentially because they are looking for a crime, because it's, at, it's because at the moment that they seek to criminalize an entire class of people, 
they have enough information on you that they can seize and pick whatever they want to use it to justify incarceration and detention. Uh, and, and so this system of mass surveillance, which looks benign, relatively, in a period of relative stability, in a period of instability, becomes a potent weapon in the hands of the state by which you can essentially round up uh, and crush any forms of legitimate dissent. And we've already seen that with the Occupy movement. Uh, you know, it be, again, just as the drug laws essentially were used to create the physical presence of militarized omnipotent policing, the laws ostensibly passed uh, against Islamic terrorism um, gave the state uh, the ability to create a legal structure by which a citizen can be instantly stripped of all of their rights. So one of the things that we've seen, and I was very involved in the Occupy movement, uh, one of the things we've seen with Occupy activists is that because they communicated electronically, the state knows who they are. They know who's important and who isn't. And we have seen the state, since the closure of the Zuccotti uh, Occupy encampment, uh, go back and, because I was involved, I, I know that they've got the right people. They know exactly who to target. They know, you know, who are the engines behind movements like that uh, because they were communicating electronically. And so what they've done to essentially, and this gets right back to uh, essentially what's happening in inner cities, is they've used felony convictions to essentially uh, neutralize activists. Mm -hmm. And the way they do it is they charge you, in the same way they do in, in, in a community like Newark, they charge you with a, uh, you know, a bunch of crimes for which you uh, can go to jail for a long period of time, very few if any that you actually committed, but that of course doesn't matter. Uh, the, the point is to force you to plea out. And uh, I'll give you an example. One of the activists that I worked with, a really interesting guy, by the way, he had gone to Columbia University on a football scholarship and had gotten quite injured in a game his freshman year, started tutoring up in Harlem uh, and, uh, and kind of awoke his consciousness. Uh, and uh, he ended up dropping out of Columbia, went back to California, became an activist, ended up finishing his degree at Berkeley. So he was in the park, and he was a very important figure uh, there from the first day, uh, part of the direct action committee. Uh, and what they did is the cops arrested him and uh, uh, when he had a pair of scissors in his hand, and they charged him with assault uh, with a deadly weapon against a New York City police officer, which is a mandatory sentence of seven years. Mm. Now, you know, what, what I love about this is they had a platform, if any of you were at Zuccotti, where they filmed 24 hours a day. Right. But of course, they didn't happen to have film of this, because it didn't happen. So they bring him up in the court. Um, initially, uh, the defense attorney uh, wants a plea agreement, and the prosecutor says, uh, we're not going to offer a plea because he's on the homeland terrorism list. Wow. Um, they eventually let him plea if he accepted a felony conviction with five years probation. That's exactly what they do. And that's what they do. You know, so many of my students in the prison system uh, uh, you know, the prosecutor is kind of selling them on this deal, but they don't understand the consequences of having a felony conviction on their record, even if they would never spent a day in jail uh, or a day in prison. And, that's, and that is the way that they have been steadily using this form of electronic surveillance to neutralize activists. Um, so much of what's happening in inner city environments, uh, such as Camden, such as Newark and others, are, are now being replicated in the wider society. Mm. Uh, and it is through the use of uh, the so-called war on drugs and the so-called war on terror, which give the state the kind of excuse to strip us of any kind of judicial or legal protection. Um, and we've seen this in, uh, uh, in my own case when I uh, when the president, I think, I, last time I was a pop, I think I mentioned that I uh, sued Barack Obama uh, over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act uh, in the Southern District Court in New York. Section 1021 permits the U.S. military, this overturns over 150 years of domestic law, permits the U.S. military 
to seize American citizens who, in the language of this section, substantially support Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces. Now, substantially support, as Gene will tell you, is not a legal term. Uh, it's not material support. It's open to wide interpretation. And what are associated forces? To hold them in military facilities, uh, strip them of due process, and keep them there indefinitely, in the language of that section, until the end of hostilities. Uh, so when we went into the Southern District Court of New York, uh, we won. Uh, one of the ways we won was because of the, the actions of a hacker named Jeremy Hammond, yeah. who I interviewed in, in uh, the MCC in New York before he got his 10-year sentence. Mm. Hammond broke into a private security firm. You know, we have 16 intelligence agencies, and 70% of the intelligence work is outsourced to corporations. Wow. And those corporations are just as busy working on behalf of themselves as they are for the government. There's a complete fusion between systems of intelligence, governmental systems of intelligence, and corporate systems of intelligence. Because we live in a corporate state, we've undergone a coup d'etat, corporate coup d'etat. Mm. And Hammond uh, leaked five million emails, Whoa. which were published by WikiLeaks. And in the course of the exchange, we saw, uh, it was quite chilling, we saw uh, uh, Stratford officials conferring with the government, attempting to link a group called U.S. Day of Rage, which is about campaign finance, uh, and Al-Qaeda. Now, on the surface of it, it's absurd, of course. Um, and yet, of course, that is precisely what they do um, in order to apply terrorism laws against dissident groups. Um, we won the case, and much to the surprise of the government, uh, and it was the, the reaction of the government was fascinating. Um, we certainly knew they would appeal, but they didn't just appeal. They went to the judge's chambers. This was a Friday afternoon, Judge Catherine Forrest Chambers. And they demanded that she put the law back into effect until the next, the appellate court would hear the appeal, which she, to her credit, refused. 9 a.m. the next morning, Monday morning, they uh, go to the Second Circuit and ask the same thing. Put the law back into effect until the appeal can be heard, which unfortunately the Second Circuit uh, granted to the government. Now why? Why would they be so aggressive about putting that law back into effect? And, and the lawyers, uh, Carl Mayer, who went to Princeton with Larry, uh, and Bruce Afron, uh, surmised uh, that the reason that they w had to have the law put back into effect quickly is because they're already using it that there are most likely already U.S. Pakistani dual nationals in some of our black sites that are uh, being held without due process, without access to lawyer, if their families don't even know where they are. And if that law was allowed to stand, then the government, if those people ever got out and could get to a lawyer, would be held in contempt of court. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way they shot us down is the way they shoot all of these things down when we got to the Second Circuit, um, the, you know, the fact of wholesale surveillance is such a black and white issue in terms of our constitutional rights and our right to privacy that no court in the land ruling on the issue could actually rule in the government's favor. And so what we have seen, especially since 9-11, and Gene can probably talk about this more intelligently than I can, is uh, the courts essentially refusing, looking for any exit so that they don't actually have to rule on the unconstitutionality mm -hmm. of what's been done to us. Mm -hmm. And so I was a plaintiff in another case called Clapper versus Amnesty International, which challenged the wholesale wiretapping and surveillance uh, and monitoring and eavesdropping of the government that got to the Supreme Court. And the Second Circuit essentially waited until the Supreme Court ruled on Clapper. Now, that case was, this was before the Snowden leaks. Mm. So we had the government lawyers getting up and lying day after day. We now know they're lying because we've read <laughs> the information that Snowden's leaked, saying things like, you know, the plaintiffs, including myself, uh, charged that the government is carrying out wholesale surveillance. Well, that's total speculation. There is no evidence that the government's carrying out wholesale surveillance. And not only that, if the government was carrying out wholesale surveillance, the plaintiffs would have been told that they were under surveillance. This was actually a statement made in this case. <laughs> 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 
and so the Supreme Court bought it, and once they ruled against us, then the Second Circuit said, well, this case was called Hedges versus Obama. Hedges doesn't have any standing in the Clapper case, and therefore he doesn't have any standing in this case, and therefore he can't bring the case, and it's out. Mm -hmm. And we petitioned the Supreme Court and assert to take the case, and they turned us down. So it is the law of the land. Mm -hmm. um, all of this is important because you have an evisceration of the legal system, which the, the kind of bellwether, the canary in the coal mine began with with poor communities where people of color, um, and, and let's talk in terms of Marx, essentially superfluous labor. Um, you know, the, they, they moved manufacturing overseas so they could pay sweatshop workers in Bangladesh 22 cents an hour, you know, and exploit them. Uh, it's, a, you know, in a form of neo-slavery in essence, uh, which is what capitalists do. And, and so all these people who had manufacturing jobs in places like Newark, Trenton was a big, Camden used to be a huge manufacturing center. Campbell Soup, Camp, Campbell Soup RCA, 36,000 people used to work in that port. And so what, they've suddenly got all this superfluous labor. And the question is how are they going to make money off of this labor? And the way they make money off of this labor is the business of mass incarceration. That's it. It's a big business. That's all it is. And I forget your name again. What? I mean, Earl. I mean, Earl, who should probably be up here talking, not me. Um, but I mean, Earl can tell you. I mean, it is just the stories you hear inside those prisons would just rip your heart out. I mean, I, I, you know, story after story. Nobody gets a fair hearing. The system, as a matter of fact, the people who usually have the longest sentences are the ones who went to trial, because they got to pressure you to plea out. If everybody goes to trial, the system's going to collapse. So if you go to trial, which often are the, the people who kind of, especially if they're young, they're kind of naive. Well, I didn't do it. I mean, I got a guy from Elizabeth. Uh, he was five years on the U.S. Army boxing team. Uh, incredible guy. And he comes back to Elizabeth out of the Army, and he's, he's training to go pro, to be a professional boxer. And he gets picked up. And... Uh, they, uh, it, it's the typical thing where they stack him full of all sorts of charges for crimes he didn't commit and, uh, and they offer him a 16 month plea he said okay plea out you get, he goes I'm not, I didn't do it and I'm not going to plea out because if I spend 16 months sitting in a jail cell I'm finished I mean it'll take me two years to get back to this level and you know become a boxer plus he's going to be two years older so he goes to court and they give him a 30 year sentence he's sitting in Rahway I got a guy in Rahway, <clears throat> he's 39 now, he was arrested in Camden when he was 14 years old. Now, he was part, it was a knifing, it was part of a gang. He goes, I, I was 90 pounds. He may have been there, I'm pretty certain he didn't do it. And they, they, so they take a 14 year old boy, they haul him into the police station in Camden and they won't let his mother come in until two in the morning, the kid's crying, he just wants to go home. He's 14 years old, he signs a confession. Mm. That's how it works. Go, sign it, you go home. He's 14. No lawyer, no mother, no guardian, no nothing. He's put in with the adult population at 14. He is not eligible to go before a parole board till he's 70. There's story after story like that. And, and, and of course you're marked once you get out no food stamps, no public account. I have to tell anyone in the room that. So that the system essentially perpetuates itself. And one of the things that's interesting as we see the breakdown of the wider society is that white people, in, beginning with white poor people who had ignored this as an issue, are now getting picked up in rural communities largely on meth and being treated the way people of color have been treated for several decades. And that goes right back to Hannah Arendt. Once you create these systems, they become insidious as the wider society devolves and the legal structure is eviscerated. You always look for the excuse. You know, Muslims become Muslim terrorists, become the excuse by which we're all supposed to give up all of our civil liberties. 
drug dealers, drug people, uh, you know, uh, they've always got an excuse. Uh, but once you normalize that kind of activity, uh, coupled with the economic evisceration that has happened, where you have created essentially an oligarchic system, an a global oligarchic elite, where none of these guys pay taxes, uh, they have committed massive amounts of fraud and criminal activity, that's not an accusation, that's a documented fact. And yet they never go to jail, ever. Uh, and so, and there's a really good book which I recommend you, I just finished reading by Matt Taibbi called Divide, and it is a look at the legal system, how the legal system works if you're rich on Wall Street and if you're poor in Newark. It's, it's quite a good book. Um, because essentially what you've created is a two-tiered legal system and a two-tiered regulatory system where the oligarchs write their own laws and write their own regulations that essentially protect them and permit them to carry out criminal activity while the oppression against especially the poor becomes harsher and harsher and harsher and harsher. Now the danger of this is that, and we'll go back to Marx, because there are no internal limits in terms of unregulated capitalism, because it will continue to exploit and exploit and exploit. The only thing, you know, uh, unfettered capitalists understand is more. Um, because they have no internal limits, then eventually there's going to be some kind of blowback, both in terms of the effects of climate change. I mean, the fossil fuel industry run our uh, or determine our relationship to the ecosystem and the, anybody who reads climate change reports uh, is probably as terrified as I am. The la one of the last ones being that the biosphere is no longer capable of absorbing the CO2 emissions and everything else. Um, coupled with this recreation of the neo-feudal economy, a world where you have an oligarchic elite and two-thirds of the country hanging on by their fingertips. Uh, crippled by debt peonage. Debt peonage, of course, has always been an effective form of social control. It's the way, after emancipation, black people were kept in, you know, slavery by another name. Um, debt peonage, we have loaded that up on our young. Uh, the largest personal debt in the country, $1 trillion, are these kids who graduated from college. And look what our government has done. If you declare bankruptcy, it doesn't affect your student loans. How thoughtful of the Congress to pass this law. Not only that, but you pay an interest rate that is actually higher than the bank interest rate. Wow. So these kids get out of college and they're, they're, they're hit with six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month often. And they, of course, can't find a job. And that is what, of course, triggered the Occupy movement uh, itself. One of the things that um, August Wilson wrote, and uh, well, is that it's a it's an interview that's worth watching with Bill Moyers. You can watch it on YouTube. It's kind of interesting. I love Moyers, but um, it was clear that August Wilson he just never got to August Wilson's level. August Wilson was, I mean, Moyers just wasn't there on the issue of race and oppression. Um, but Wilson is incredible. Uh, and he talks about that warrior spirit. He said, you know, the, that most of the warriors in black communities are behind bars. Mm -hmm. Because when the wider society uh, didn't offer them an opportunity mm -hmm. through legitimate means to provide for their families, they found illegitimate means to provide for their families. And I would say that that's true. And I've taught. Um, at all sorts of universities, Columbia, Princeton, New York University. And I think one of the things that is so uh, painful is uh, teaching in a place like Rahway or Trenton this summer and running into these individuals who are so brilliant, have so much integrity, um, have so much to offer to the wider society, um, and are just sitting behind bars for decades. Um, uh, you know, Un, unheralded, unappreciated, and even reviled uh, by the wider community. I, um, last fall, 
um, taught a course on drama. And uh, so we read uh, James Baldwin, read uh, August Wilson's Fences, which really resonated with my class, by the way. I don't know if you know the play Fences, but it's about a father-son relationship. And uh, yeah, all of my students said, you know, that was my father. Um, we read uh, Dutchman by Amira Baraka, which is, of course, brilliant. Actually, it was kind of controversial, but there's a, a, a Robert Crumb cartoon, which is called When the Niggers Take Over America. Um, and he's been condemned for it, but I think it's brilliant because I think he actually captures internally why white people are scared of black people. Um, and Richard Wright actually writes about this in his journals. He said, you know, it's lucky black people forget because if they didn't forget, every white person in this country should live in sheer terror of, you know, given the history of African Americans. And I think Crumb kind of nailed it. I actually gave him that and I gave him Dutchman because Dutchman is exactly about the same point, uh, about, uh, you know, that internal fear that white people, including white liberals, have about black people. Um, we read uh, brother-sister plays. I don't know if you know McNeely is also brilliant. Um, but what was interesting is I, um, as an experiment, <coughs> first week, I said, okay, I want you to sit and read these plays, and we'll discuss them, but I want you to write <coughs> scenes, dramatic scenes from your own life. Not, not necessarily off of the street, even just between you and your mother, what you remember, you and your brother. And so I had 28 students, and um, uh, that first week, I got all those 28 scenes. And there's a kind of smell of prison that ca is in the paper, you know, when I would bring it home. And I would smell, the, you know, that kind of musty smell, and I'd smell it. It was kind of quite powerful. I bring in all those papers, and I started going through them. And I get, you know, three, four scenes in, and I suddenly hit this thing of gold. I'm a writer. And then a couple more, I hit this thing of gold. I had like five or six guys in there who could really write. Mm. And it turns out that uh, because they listen to BAI, and because I'm on BAI, <laughs> They knew who I was, and they actually had a couple tattered copies of my books. It was quite moving. They brought in later to have me sign. And so I had attracted the best writers in the prison. And I thought, you know, I might actually be able to do something with this. And so uh, I was under the rule, you know, anybody who's dealt with the Department of Corrections, it's like something out of Kafka's penal colony. Um, I got a. They had no, it was kind of touching. They had, they want, they, because this is a college program step, which we, were you, did you go to Rahway? Were you in Rahway? I had, I had already earned my degree. Oh. Then. I earned my degree in 1980. Out of where, out of Trenton? Out of Trenton State and Mercer County. Oh, because now there's no pro program in Trenton. Yeah, no. I know. Yeah. We're trying to get it in. There's no program in Trenton. So, um, um, what was I? I forget where I was. Uh, yeah, I the what? I thought you would do something with, right with the oh. gym. Yeah. So, oh yeah, right. So I had one night a week, and the only way you could get another night a week is if you petitioned, don't tell anybody, please. Anybody work for the DOC in here? Don't tell <laughs> The only way you can get them another night is if you say they need remedial help. <laughs> so I wrote all 28 of them down and said they all need remedial help <laughs> for another night a week. And so I went in, and I got guys in there who can write like I do. I mean, you know, and I had to break it to them. Well, I've signed you up for Remedia. And one of them goes, how many of us? I go, all of you. <laughs> <laughs> so we threw another night in, and, uh, and I was supposed to be writing my book. And I didn't tell my publisher, but I dropped it because instead of writing a book, I was taking uh, all of these scenes and trying to hammer them into a play. And um, we couldn't perform it. Uh, it is, a, you know, it, the name of the play, by the way, is Caged. And it's about cages, the cages 
in places like, well, most of them from Newark, by the way, the cages in places like Newark, the invisible cages in Newark, mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and, the, and the visible cages in Trenton, and the play actually set the play in Trenton because they were all in Trenton, and Trenton was, is a horror show compared to Rahway's The Holiday Inn compared to Trenton. Wow. They wanted to set it in Trenton. And um, so I thought, what am I going to do? I mean, they put all this work into it. And so I invited uh, James Cohn, uh, the father of black liberation theology, who preached yeah. at my ordination on Sunday, yeah. uh, and Cornell West, who also spoke at my ordination. And we threw out all those Presbyterian hymnals and brought in a blues band. <laughs> um, It was a very un-Presbyterian event. <laughs> so actually had some content and meaning to it. Um, and so I brought them in as the audience. And um, <clears throat> this is classic DOC. I mean, everything about working in the prison. When I would, that when, when they, they had no, so you have these guys, they're incredibly intelligent. And they, have, they don't have access to real books. I mean, they have popular stuff, but they can't get, you know, Nietzsche or history or stuff. And so um, what I would do, and it, it pays every once in a while to look like I do with a little button-down shirt. I once was wearing a shirt. I always kind of dress up for them, just like I do. I dress just like I would at Princeton. It's kind of hokey, but okay. I always go in in a suit and look like I would at Princeton. But one day the AC was off, and... It, I'm embarrassed to admit it. I do have some shirts that have a monogram on it with my like initials, and so I teach the whole class. In the class, one of the students raises their hand and goes, "Why you got your name on your shirt?" <laughs> and the guy next to him goes, "Oh, you didn't know that? That's what white people do. <laughs> they they put their names on the shirt, and it's not because they think anybody's going to steal it." <laughs> Which does point out the absurdity of putting your name on your shirt. <laughs> so we got to the um, lobby. Now this is, oh, I didn't tell about the library. So they didn't have any library. So they're trying to write college papers, but there's no, they have no resource by which they can do research. And uh, they said to me, one of the first classes, well, we're trying to build a library. And I said, well, how many books do you have? And they said, 11. So uh, what I did is I went to the big bookstore in Princeton, Labyrinth, and um, uh, the owners, uh, Dorte and Cliff, said, OK, you can go into our warehouse. And as many books as you can get in, you can take. Um, and it was an experiment. We got first shipment through. It was 150 books. We got them up. I, so I got to my class, and I said, well, the good news is that I just got 150 books in here for you, but the bad news is that I picked them out. Yeah. So it's all Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Plato, and you know what? They were ecstatic. Yeah. They were ecstatic. Mm -hmm. And I managed to get um, 722 books in by the time. Yeah. But I, every, I spent so many hours in that mail room, I thought I was the white version of Step and Fetch It. <laughs> I, it's really against my nature to be Step and Fetch It. Um, but I was licking the boots of those COs and chatting people up and being humiliated because once you get in that prison, everybody's a prisoner. Everyone is a prisoner. It, my treatment's not as severe, but you know, they're, they're God in there. Um, and I'd, I literally would have to leave that mail room, go out, go straight to a drugstore and buy Tylenol because I had like these pounding headaches, which I'm sure you lived with for many years. Um, so, uh, so we got there that night. Now this was, you know, incredibly moving moment. Um, th that play, you know, has real power, real power. It's real, and uh, not just in terms of their experiences, but synthesizing, analyzing, understanding power. And so we get to the lobby, and I'm there with Cornell West and James Cone. And if you have not read James Cone's last book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, mm. you got to buy it tomorrow. Wow. I'm serious. Whether you're Christian 
It doesn't matter. That is one of the most brilliant, revolutionary critiques of white power, and especially white religious power. Mm -hmm. wow. um, Cone calls the white church the Antichrist. Um, not in that book, but he's done it before. Uh, and because he writes about lynching. And he says, what was lynching but the crucifixion? What was it? That's what it was. And yet, no one white church, one white theologian, they said nothing. All through the reign of terror. And he sets that against real faith. Anyway, it's stunning. Stunning book. It's not long. I mean, every sentence he writes is kind of golden. So Cone is there, Cornell's there, and the warden's there. I've never even seen the warden. So <laughs> classic warden, buzz cut, former CO. He goes, well, you're not going to your classroom. You're going to the chapel. And so we're all marched off to the chapel, and I get to the chapel, and not only is the warden standing down there, but the major, which is the highest uniform officer in a prison, and a bunch of COs are all standing back. Well, this creates a kind of panic because... There's no way we can read this play in front of all of these people. If it was just us in a classroom, we could do it. Uh, but I'm walking out of there. All of my students are remaining behind. And the retribution, the ca capacity for retribution, you have you know, this much space in a prison, but that much space is incredibly precious. That much liberty is incredibly precious. And with a flick of a switch, it's gone. I mean, you know they've outlawed stingers in uh, yes, Trenton. They did quite right, they did before he left. So one of my students in Trenton was caught with a stinger. Now stingers are what you use to heat up water. And it, up until recently, it was legal to have a stinger. Mm -hmm. Then they just outlawed it. They caught him with a stinger. They put him in isolation for 90 days. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of life in prison. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. So, um, so I don't want that retribution. And, uh, and so all of these guys, and I mean, the thing about Rahway is, I don't know how much, do you have like a lot of weights in the yard in Trenton? You do have weights in Trenton, right? No, not no more. Not no more. No, we got them in Rahway. Yeah. In Rahway, so these guys are huge. All they do is lift weights. I got a guy in there, his name is Kabir, which is Arabic for big. I mean, this guy must be like 280, have a solid muscle anyway. So they're big in Rahway. And, uh, and they all get in a huddle because they know the system better than I do, and decide what parts of the play they can read and what they can't. And um, <clears throat> because it's all written out of their experience, I had one guy, I, one assignment was, I want you to think back on a moment, just a tender moment with your mother, and I want you to write a scene about it. And at the end of the class, one of my students came up and said, well, what if we were a product of rape? And I said, well, then, Tim, you got to write about it. And that ended up being incorporated into the play. And I think he's from Newark. But, and all of this is autobiographical. So what happens is he gets picked up in a car in Newark, and there's a weapon in the car. It doesn't belong to him. It belongs to his half-brother. And if nobody takes possession, they all get hit with it. And he tells the cop, it's mine. And he goes to jail. And he calls his mother from jail. And he says, it doesn't matter, Ma, because I was never supposed to be here anyway. You have the son you love. Wow. That kind of self-sacrifice, which is not uncommon in the prison. And so Timmy gets up and reads it. And then, you know, they were reading parts of the play. And I look around and ask my other students, well, where's Timmy? And they said, I think he's in the bathroom. And I went, ran down the end of the chapel in the bathroom, and there was him shaking, hunched over, weeping in the corner of the bathroom. That kind of pain. I mean, one of my, I remember one of my students saying, you know, even if our families don't visit, it doesn't mean they don't love us, just as an aside. So we finished that writing, reading the play, uh, and then, Cornell and Cone spoke. Now the interesting thing about Cone is that he grew up in segregated Arkansas and his parents were woodcutters. They were virtually illiterate, uh, dirt poor poverty. And uh, as a kid, he had a sack around him and picked cotton in the summer. 
and I was standing behind Cornell and Cone, and I, I saw, especially when Cone got up there, that he looked into the faces of my students and saw himself. Uh, I told him it was like bringing the angel, angel Gabriel into prison uh, because he knew that, you know, but for a slight variation in chance, he would be where they are. Mm. Um, and um, when I sat behind both Cornell and Cohn when they were speaking, uh, uh, I, I looked out and, and saw a lot of my students crying. Mm -hmm. And I had my last class the next night. And one of my students, who had spent 11 years on death row, uh, the f even before the class started, he got up. He said, well, he said, you may have seen that I was crying last night. Um, I've been in this prison system since 1984. And the night that Dr. Cohn and Dr. West came to speak to us was the only happy night I ever spent in prison. And he sat down. So the last class, we'd done the reading. And they gave me, they all signed the copy of the play. And if you know August Wilson's great play, Joe Turner Come and Gone, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, it's set in 1910 in a boarding house in Pittsburgh where people are trying to pull their lives back together after the, the Holocaust of slavery. And recover their identity as, as human beings. And there's a conjurer in the play named Joe Loomis who keeps telling them that you have to find your song. And so, I can never talk about this. And so when they signed that play for me, I knew that was their song. And I told them I would take it to every theater director I knew in New York. But that getting a play produced in New York was like winning the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> and I did take it to every theater director in New York. And it will be produced in a New York theater in the fall of 2004. Yeah. I'll let you know. And I went back and told them, and every single one immediately said the same thing, can our families go? And I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Well, I may know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to have buses for your families in Newark on opening night. Nice. And they are going to be there to see your play. Um, and that's it. It's their voices, which this wider society has snuffed out or satirized and belittled through the commercial media to turn these people into caricatures, stereotypes, people we are supposed to either laugh at or fear. And that form of dehumanization is fundamental to corporate culture and is poison. And I think that one of the reasons that I admire so pop, pop so much and one of the reasons that I was ordained, by the way, to work in the prisons. That's all I will do. I'm not going to have a church. No church would really want me, frankly. Um, but it's all to be in the prisons. And I've, as soon as I got ordained, the, the first thing I did, the first thing I did was to begin the process to go in there on Christmas Day and hold a Christmas service for those prisoners. Whether they're Christian or not, it doesn't matter. But on Christmas Day, I want to be in there with them. And I think so much of the struggle that all of us care about is not only the struggle for justice, but the struggle to make these voices heard, appreciated, and honored. And that's why I'm here tonight, because everybody in this organization, starting with the great Larry Ham on down, does this. Um, and it's just been a privilege to be here. Thank you very much. Anybody have a question? Yes.
I will sign the book as soon. I won't leave before I sign it. I promise. Did you bring any? Joanne, Diane, and then Akili. Joanne, Diane, Akili. What's the name of the play again? Caged. What's the? It's the play. It's called Caged. In the fall of 2015. And uh, I have only one of my students is getting out. He's getting out this spring. He's from Newark. Uh, never committed a violent crime. Over 10 years in prison. Uh, he's brilliant. He was in Trenton. Uh, Boris Franklin, did you know him? You know Boris? He's an amazing guy. Uh, yeah, everybody's got different names. You know, Boris doesn't go by Boris, so I don't even know. I think he goes by Fahim or... I, I may know Swat. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. He, he got into Trenton. He's about 40 now. And he saw all these kids coming in who were messed up. And he just bought a bunch of psychology books. And he just started tutoring them. And uh, Boris was one of my the engines. He's really smart um, and really good writer. And uh, he wrote huge sections of the play. So he's getting out in the spring. And I've already asked the theater director because once you're on, uh, when you get out on probation, it's very hard to cross state lines, but, but we're going to try and get permission for him to be in the play. So he, he, when he gets out, his job will actually be to work with professional actors in that play. Diane. I, I, it is going to be published. Uh, I already have a contract to have it published. But I'm, I'm working with a lot of the students to rewrite it because I never thought it would be staged, honestly. And so I want to get it to be as good as it can. And fortunately, my wife is an actress, a um, professional actress. So she's been working with me because it reads really well, but that doesn't mean it's going to work really well on a stage. So we're really trying to fine tune it and revise it. So I will publish it, but not until I've been able to do the revisions. Um, Akilah. Who who's, who's agreed to The Culture it? Project. Culture. And uh, director. They don't have a director yet, but obviously I think we need an African American director to have some sensitivity to. The gentleman in the back. Yes. Uh, first, I got first, you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, hey, God bless you. I have a question to ask you, but before I do, I wanted to say that uh, hey, God bless you too, Brother Earl. And, and I understand uh, uh, just, just a tiny bit of what you're going through. And in 1966, I was arrested in Louisiana for uh, possession of five marijuana cigarettes. And, and I wound up serving uh, three years in jail. When I was in the admitting unit, uh, I never met this person, but I witnessed a man named Wood Fox get beat up half to death by the police, by the correctional officers uh, for, for I, I don't even remember now, but it was, it was for little or nothing. And eventually what happened is that, you know, he was put into an admitting unit a, a, a um, segregated unit, and and eventually what happened is that they charged him with killing a, a correctional officer, and he's been locked up since 1966. Mm -hmm. wow. And um, I'm, I was wondering if you know the case of, of Wood Fox, and if not, if you can look into it, because he's been trying to get out of prison since 1966. Is he in Louisiana? He is in Angola, Louisiana. Oh. And, and w, um, uh, BAI did a story on him earlier this year. And you, you can, you can uh, go online and find his story. I, I forget his first name, but his last name is Wood Fox. Well, I have one lawsuit pending, and that is over uh, after the Lucasville prison uprising. 1994, 1993, I don't remember. Do you remember, Earl? Was it 94? Yeah. 94, I think. Lo longest occupation of a prison uh, in American history. What they did is one guard was killed. And as far as we can tell, the person who actually physically killed the guard immediately after the prison was retaken uh, became uh, an informant for the state. And what he did was finger the, ring the people who had organized the uprising. And what was interesting about that uprising, and there's actually a book about it by Staunton Lind that's pretty good if you want a good history of it. Um, what they did is they used this guy who had actually carried out the killing. And he's out now, of course. This is how it works. And he, he fingered the five, and, and that prison uprising was successful because it crossed color lines. You actually had people from what's it called the white Aryan nation or you know these white supremacist groups actually joined. And that's, of course, once you break down the divisions within, 
a prison or a community which power elites always consciously form, um, then you become a force. Uh, and they took those five guys and they put them on death row and they have been sitting in isolation on death row since 1994. God. And the press cannot interview them. So uh, through Staunton Lind, who's an amazing figure in his own right, that's another night, had been a Yale prof history professor, had opposed the Vietnam War, uh, had been thrown out of Yale, had been blacklisted, went to Chicago Law School, moved to Youngstown and started representing mostly steel workers that were losing their jobs and since for the last two decades has been fighting for prisoners' rights. So uh, we conspired with Staunton that I wrote a letter to the Ohio Board of Corrections asking to interview all five. Mm. And as soon as the Ohio Corrections Board wrote a letter back saying you cannot interview all five, I sued them. And so we're suing them now through the ACLU in Ohio. Sandra. I received, I just happened to receive a call today from a Miss Muhammad from the North Ex Detention Center. And she said it was under the, the director of a Mr. Young, I think she said, but we give a black history program in Irvington. And she asked if we wouldn't mind coming in there for the youth that was locked up there. And she said most of them was returning committing crimes to come back in there because that was the only form of stability that they knew because they knew that people in there cared about them. They could get to go to school. They had a place to sleep. And they had they knew that they were going to be eaten. I, I mean, that they were going to have food to eat. <laughs> so um, they said they had knew Larry Ham. So I was like, you know, there's a lady in our organization, Miss Ross, I said, I'll certainly um, pass this information on to her too, so maybe she could get them some information. But they too do not have any books it on Black History. No, it's in North. Oh, the it's North the prison. North Youth House. Is this North prison? North. Uh, the North, North Youth House. Oh, Youth House. Youth House. Yeah, because yeah, the Northern is in North, right? What, what's North. it's Northern, Northern, yes. Northern. Yeah, but these are um, these are children I'm talking wow. about. And so I was talking about the different programs that. Um, where I could call people and ask if they could come in there. And she said they would uh, open their arms to people who like to come in there and speak and um, talk to them. So I think you would be a. Is this a halfway house? No. No, no. it's, no. it's, it's like a, a detention center. Right? Is this run by the DOC? Yes. So I, I don't know anything uh, about like, the system like that. D so DOC here. and open arms don't usually go together. Uh. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, I'll definitely check on it. Yeah. Um, I mean, right now I'm in Rahway, so I'm there teaching, teaching, actually teaching the souls of black folks right now. She's talking about the children and the juvenile thing. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Uh, I'm Nifu and Earl. I'm Nifu and Earl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much for your very thorough lecture. Yeah. Uh, what, you uh, what is your observation? There seems to be a national pattern from coast to coast of mostly police departments to kill young black men. Hardly a day go by if you don't hear of some case for whatever reason. Man reaching in his man for cop, ask for a driver's license, man reaching pick up his driver's license, he gets blown away. I mean, that happens all kind of ways. But I'm saying, do you see a national pattern? Do you think there's something going on in these, in these brotherhoods of police departments? across the country to specifically target young black men. Now, one more, um, you, would you please comment, but you, you mentioned about the corruption in the judiciary, about these judges in Pennsylvania, I'll show you a bad case. These judges who were, who, who were sent to jail for selling people, selling young yeah, black people right. to these private prisons. Right. Well, that gets to the point that it's a business. Yes. And, you know, that it's a kind of, that is, a, you know, an egregious, it, they kind of, it was so egregious they crossed the line and it was too much because the business has to be like under the veneer of legality. I mean, so, but that's essentially kind of raw, rawly what's happening. Um, these, like, uh, like, you know, prisons corporations, corrections corporations of America, I mean, these are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, which, which really is like, <coughs> slaveholding companies trading on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, let's be clear. That's basically what it is. And, uh, and that whole engine of being a business. I mean, one of the things that's so appalling 
is so you're locked up in prison. You can't make a living, or you know, you make a dollar a day if you're lucky, if you have a job, and and you're gouged right and left for money, all, in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, whether it's your family trying to put money in the commissary, whether it's you trying to make phone calls, well, all the phone calls are collect at like astronomical rates. You know, on and on and on. Um, and that's what's, what happens in a society where essentially you create whole classes of people that are stripped of their rights and then you have predatory capitalist organizations that prey on everybody but particularly prey on those who have no ability to fight back. Um, and what was the other question you had on the... Oh, a pattern. On, yeah, well this gets back to the whole thing of omnipotent. It, they do it because they can because there's no repercussions. They can kill anyone they want. And, you know, I, I mean, frankly, I don't understand how they have been able to do this for so long. I mean, maybe it's because of mass incarceration and because so many people who are out are on probation and, you know, are terrified of going back, which becomes a way to immobilize them. Um, but they do it because they can. Earl. You know, uh, I was uh, around and I was drafted in the Vietnam War. And um, me and Geronimo Pratt, yeah. a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in America, you have more black men die in one year than died in the entire 11 years of the Vietnam War. Wow. Oh. In Vietnam, in, in that war, which went from 1962 all the way up to 73, which was about 11 years. You had 5,500 young black men die in that war. In one year in America, you got up to 12,000 young black men die a year in this country. <coughs> so it's, more, it's safer for a black man to be in a war wow. than to be right here in America. Wow. It's, not, it's not bad it is. But you have to understand that. You have to understand why that go on and why it happened. And by the way, I spent 12 years in MCU Lock up, SSA, it's lock up, MCU. I spent 12 years there without coming out of that room. That was, were you there with Audrey Latula? Was Audrey it? was my, is my best friend. He's been my best friend since 1960. Audrey, Audrey was there on Sunday with Bonnie. Well, I put both of them out. I, I worked with both of them. Right. And Gene, you up there sometime right. at the uh, 89 Market Street. So Audrey is one of my best friends. Okay. Well, let me, let me just ask Earl a question. Why do you think that we can s that why do you think that this kind of slaughter of black youth is being carried out with impunity and there's no reaction we know why the wider you know yeah. kind of moneyed white society is not reacting but why why within the you know especially marginal communities why why haven't we seen a kind of revolt because black Black people in America do not stand up for their children. Black, the black people who mean something in America refuse to stand up for black men in America because they think of young black men as a threat to them, and they wear a lot. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the big, that's one of the problems. But then they don't place value on young black men's lives. Nobody place value on. Them. I mean, if I walk up to you and tell you, say, "Oh, two young black men down on Broadway Market got killed tonight." Oh, yeah? So that's it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We don't place no value on young black men's lives. Yeah. This bad. I just want to know the name of that book you said we should read about lynching by Cone. The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cone. Yeah. It's an amazing book. Thank you. Everything he wrote is amazing. Martin and Malcolm, on, uh, comparing Martin and Malcolm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he's, he's the real thing. So K O A J. C O N E. The young man in the back, and then Dave. Yes. All right, so um, my name is Ed Wilkie Parker. I'm a senior at Science Park High School. Oh, give him a hand. Senior at Science Park. Yeah. Right. First of all, I'd like to say like, I was deeply moved by everything you're saying. And like, um, one question that was coming through my head was like, yeah, we're talking about the issue of like um, capitalism and like. Racism in the sense, but how, like, what do we do about it? We acknowledge it. Like, what would you say is a conflict situation? Or is that what you should say? Is it a conflict situation? 
because corporate capitalism has essentially seized our judiciary, our systems of information, our systems of education, which you've been fighting in Newark, and our two major political parties, there is no way now by which we can achieve reform through the system. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't matter on what issue. I mean, for instance, the Democratic Party will speak rationally about climate change, but the Democratic Party fracks and drills and does offshore seismic text testing and pumps down bitumen from the Alberta tar sands, just like Sarah Palin. <laughs> the, the assault on civil liberties under Obama has been worse than under Bush. And we have to, real, we have to stop being fooled by the system. You know, we are about, we have already begun a presidential campaign for 2016. It's nuts. We know who it's going to be. And we get all caught, all caught up in personalities. We could very well, uh, whoever thought anybody could resurrect Mitt Romney. That shows you how dead our political system is. <laughs> it's either going to be Hillary and Romney or Hillary and Jeb Bush. I, I mean... What, do we only got two families in this country that can... It's like the end of Rome, where you had about six, seven oligarchic families. They just traded power back and forth. And so, at this point, and the situation's really serious, because our civil liberties have been eviscerated. We're completely monitored. We're, the, the economy is stagnant or declining and will get worse. Wall Street is back up to all the old crimes. All the, they, not only were they not punished, the, they looted the U.S. Treasury to the tune of $17 trillion, the people who, trillion, to the, uh, to people, the, so the people who committed the crime get the money and the victims are left with their houses underwater. And they can't find work. Even the people who lost their jobs in 2008, we know in studies and in African American communities it's always worse, they've gone back to jobs that are paying, you know, a third without benefits. So. The, the whole focus of this system is basically guaranteed for a kind of downward spiral. And they know it. And so they have created legal mechanisms and physical mechanisms through omnipotent policing so that when we wake up, they're ready to slam us. And, and, and the only hope we have is organizing at a grassroots level, carrying out acts of mass civil disobedience, and not being fooled by their propaganda. Mm. Mm. Because <laughs> Barack Obama, who had a mandate in 2008, has essentially done the bidding of the corporate elite since the moment he entered office. And, uh, and it really doesn't matter who follows him. I mean, there has been a complete continuity between Bush and Obama in terms of the expansion of imperial wars, the evisceration of civil liberties, the failure to curb Wall Street, the inability to deal with the suffering of working men and women. I mean, think about it. You take banks, Citibank, Wells Fargo, whatever, these banks that shove subprime mortgages down people's throat, not only knowing that they couldn't pay it, but knowing that they had written into the contract all sorts of clauses so, so that they thought they were going to be paying one thing a month and they were paying something else every month that they couldn't afford. And they knew it. They bet against it. Um, th that, that when, when we talked about how these corporations prey on prisoners, these corporate forces <coughs> always target the powerless, the disempowered, the vulnerable. And as we become more vulnerable, they will become more predatory. Uh, and I think that we have to recognize power for what it is and understand that um, we have to think about reversing the corporate coup d'etat, that essentially eradicating these systems of power. And I think that's why Wall, the Occupy Wall Street had it right. Wall Street is where the center of power is now. It's not Washington. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dave and the yeah. professor. Um, I just wanted to point out, though, that the massive job loss of which you spoke and which lies at the heart of so much of this, it's not due 
to the export of jobs. It's due to the increase of productivity and so many jobs right across the economy kind of being automated out of existence. And, uh, you know, that's a very steady, very observable trend, particularly in 1979. And the point of that is that it brings in the whole scope of organized labor. Because, you know, many of the things we're saying, well, why is nobody fighting against this uh, exploitation of uh, prisoners and so forth? And it's because organized labor uh, has been losing members, has been subject to draconian labor laws, just atrocious, and also is so tightly tied to the Democratic Party. So that's another whole area of struggle that has to be opened Well, let up. me, let me, I mean, you're right about automation, and yet at the same time we have exported huge amounts of manufacturing. I mean, literally after 1994 and NAFTA, we saw pe factories being crated up, literally, and shipped to, like, the northern part of Mexico. Uh, so, you know, there isn't much that's made other than weapons in the United States anymore. Uh, we, we don't make our own clothes. Uh, we don't make our own electronics. Apple, in terms of Apple in China, has over, through subsidiaries, over 700,000 employees who are making slave wages. When they don't meet their quotas, they're often not paid. They're living in overcrowded dormitories, which is why you get high suicide rates, because when they don't make the quotas and they're not paid, it means their families back home starve and they climb to the roofs and jump off and kill themselves. So that's another economic discussion. But I think that, I don't think how you can look around Newark and not say, that we've eviscerated our manufacturing. There's, this city's been cut in half in terms of population, and there's one empty warehouse and factory after another. Just Professor, real, um, two and then things. One is Marco, um, to make sure that the, um, the individuals who wrote the play, that they get credit, how are they gonna get credit? And That's a really good question. I'll, I'll tell you how I did it, because, and I had a long discussion with them about this. So what I did is, uh, one of the most moving parts of the play is that I began the play by writing I had them write their own bios. Like, if you take the 28 people in my class, cumulatively, they have spent 550 years in prison. And they're not, a lot of them aren't even done. So, but I worry about retribution because that play says it like it is. And I don't want them to suffer. Uh, and so what we have done is, uh, when we wrote the play, it was Trenton State. Uh, we changed the name to Scarborough Prison. Um, I left the bios in, but I took off their last names. Um, so you still will read the bios. Um, but we have to make sure that this pr is presented as a work of fiction. Um, otherwise, th the full force of the DOC is going to come down on us. Okay, the other part that I wanted to say just real quick is that you know, I teach American government, and one of the things I tell my students all the time is that we have a very uh, ill-informed and low-information public. And you know, I'd like you to comment on it, because a lot of the problems we have is because people don't know how government works and how to make it accountable to them. And you haven't worked for corporate media I did. Uh, to give people <laughs> an idea of the, the impact that corporate media has on, in terms of social control and why people are so ill-informed or uninformed or low-informed. Um, you want to speak to that? Well, because as soon as you make an astute critique of power, I mean, this goes right to Chomsky, um, and I wrote a book, Death of the Liberal Class, that deals precisely with this issue, although everything I learned about the liberal class comes from Chomsky. I saw him in Boston a few weeks ago, and I told him I should have put you down as a co-author, because basically I just ingested Chomsky. But Chomsky points out correctly that the way it works is like this. You have a liberal class, and the liberal class is allowed to critique the excesses of power. So the way the liberal class functions is, uh, you know, whether it's the Vietnam War or whether it's the Iraq War, is after it, we realize that it was a big mistake, they are allowed to say, oh, well, you know, uh, we didn't understand that there would be an insurgency. We didn't understand this. But you're never allowed to critique the virtue, the virtues, of the people who prosecuted the war. Once you question the motives and the goals, then immediately you get pushed out of the mainstream. Well, yeah, King, Malcolm, Chomsky, Norman Finkelstein, you know, Howard Zinn, uh, you know, there's a long list. And so, so you know, so the role of the media, you asked about the corporate media, the corporate media sets the parameters by which you have acceptable debate. 
And as soon as you cross that parameter, you immediately become a pariah. And then they shut you out. So in my case, for instance, because I have this critique, uh, I will never appear, I, do, I got on Moyers. He gave me an hour for my book, Moyers, although it was going off the air. And Moyers is probably the only kind of show on national TV, you know, along with Amy Goodman, but, you know, that deals seriously with power. Um, but if I go to Canada, I mean, this also happens to Chomsky, I can get on CBC <coughs> on prime time to the whole country for a half hour between 8 and 8.30. Mm. If I go to France, the same thing. But within the United States, this critique is completely unpalatable. You cannot question the virtue of power. You cannot question the motive of corporate power. You can't, you know, describe the facade of democracy that exists. You know, rip back the veil and show how the engine actually works. Because if you do that, then you're, you're completely pushed out of the fringes. And that is what the role of the corporate media is. The corporate media sets the acceptable parameters of debate. It's 8.59. Katrina, you have the last okay. question. Well, first, I'd just like to say what an honor it is to be here and hear you speaking. I'm a writer, and you're one of my favorite top three. So when my mentor here told me last week that you were coming to speak, it was like um, waiting for Christmas. <laughs> very meaningful to me. Thank you very much. You really changed my life. Added so much. Um, you spoke about when the masses do wake up and they clamp down on us. And for me, I feel it is this palpable thing that it's just around the corner and I'm just wondering when do you think it's going to happen? How much longer we have? That's a really good question. <laughs> it's a really good question but the, and I can tell you because I've covered I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe I covered the two Palestinian uprisings or intifadas, I covered the street demonstrations that brought down Slobodan Milosevic is that no one knows even people as smart as Larry Hamm <laughs> don't know nobody knows Nobody knows. You asked me that question. In yeah, the, in nobody the knows. It's a mystery. What ignites it, you know, and that's why pop is so important. Because, and I was telling Larry, you know, when I covered East Germany in Leipzig, you had every week these candlelit, candlelit uh, vigils, mostly by Lutheran clergy, uh, defined the communist regime. And, you know, it was like pop. They get a few dozen people, they get this or that week after week after week, and then suddenly it was 70,000 people. Now the reason that pop is important is because when it comes, people need an address. They need to know where to go, and they need to know who they can trust. So when I covered the revolution in Czechoslovakia, the Velvet Revolution, you had a, a Václav Havel, the great dissident figure who later became president. Now Havel, in 1977, founded Charter 77, with 77 other writers and intellectuals that defied the regime. And from 77 to 89, Havel was a non-person. His plays were never performed. His essays and books were never published. He was never heard on the state media. And yet, when the Velvet Revolution erupted, the whole country knew who they had to turn to. And I think I was used to be every evening we used to meet. He used to meet the foreign press in a theater called the Magic Lantern Theater in Prague. So I was in there. And the thing about Havel, what was fascinating is that he was not a good speaker, unlike Larry. He wasn't very charismatic, you know, unlike Larry. <laughs> and, and yet everybody knew that, that they could trust him because he'd held fast to that moral imperative. And I think that when you carry out acts of resistance, you know, there's, a, there's an essay by the anarchist Alexander Berkman called The Invisible Revolution, where he talks about how revolutions are like boiling water, that you never see it, the wider society never sees it. It seems to like suddenly erupt out of nowhere, but it never erupts out of nowhere. It's building after years, decades even, and then suddenly appears below the surface. And the key is, of course, the discrediting of the ideas, and in this case capitalism, that supports the power structure. Because the more those ideas are discredited, and we are seeing those ideas discredited across the political spectrum, from the Tea Party all the way to Pop, which always hated capitalism, but, um, but you're seeing the ideas discredited. Less and less people have faith in the system, 9% approval rating in Congress. And when you have a discrediting of the ideas that justify the systems of power, 
then power increasingly has to use force and violence in order to maintain control. And that's why the use of force and violence is becoming uh, even more heavy-handed than it was. Uh, and should there ever be a moment of unrest or instability, they have already, because they've run scenarios about unrest in the NSA, I mean, you know, that's what their job. They have built a legal and a physical mechanism by which they can come down on us. And I will just add that, you know, it can go wrong. That America has a long tradition of primarily white vigilante violence, which is tolerated by the state. And that's whether that's the Klan, whether that's the white citizens councils, which were in the South, basically the armed wing of the Democratic Party. They used to go to parks with guns and, pra and carry out like military exercises. Uh, whether that is the right wing Cuban groups. Uh, and, and, and what has happened in America is that our populist and radical groups that represent the poor and the working class in the name of anti-communism have been largely destroyed. So if there is an eruption, what, we, we cannot discount the fact that that Tea Party, militia, Christian right, largely white, heavy undercurrent of racism, fusing the Christian religion with the iconography and language of the state will be unleashed. What, what happens with vigilante violence is that you use white vigilante violence as a kind of supra judicial, extrajudicial force. So. Let's take that uprising in Nevada, remember over that rancher, oh, yeah. where you had all, now imagine if those people had been black. They'd be dead, I'm not joking, they'd be dead. Or imagine if they were radical environmentalists like Earth First. And the reason, these guys all show up with guns, threatening uh, um, federal, they weren't troops, they were uh, land, officers. Uh, federal officers from, well, say, and they don't do anything to them. Because, and that's a window into how that white vigilante violence, which has always been part of American society, Richard Hofstadter writes about it in his book, Violence, has always been part of American society, and it's kind of kept in reserve. And totalitarian, to go back to Hannah Arendt, always use vigilantes, even the Nazis, for instance. So you had, what people don't understand is that often, is that when Hitler took power in 33, between 33 and 38, he only mentioned the Jews three times. It was the brown shirts that were carrying out the violence, and oftentimes Hitler was saying, oh, well, they've gone too far. That's how vigilante groups work. So should there be uh, unrest, we who come out of the radical populist groups that, have been, that were on the eve of World War I, uh, you know, let's go back and look at the persecution of uh, black power groups, in the 60s, the 70s, isolation units were created for people like Earl. That's why we had them, not because they ever committed any infractions, but because they didn't want them preaching, preaching to the other people in the prison. That's why they were isolated. So I think we've got to look at this kind of coldly, and it's kind of frightening, um, because America is a deeply violent culture and, uh, and always has been. And, uh, and and if, you know, for instance, you rise up, you are not only going to have to deal with federal forces, but you're going to have to deal with these extrajudicial vigilante groups that are going to be able to kill with impunity. And that's always been true in American history. So what's going to happen? Something's going to happen. Because when you unleash corporate capitalism like this, without any restraints, they know no limits. There are no limits. Um, they will grind everything down, the ecosystem down, human beings down, until there's blowback. And when there's blowback, their response will not be reform, and we've already seen it. I mean, you have the Occupy movement. What's a rational response to the Occupy movement? Well, forgiveness of student debt, that would be rational. A moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions. Health care for all Americans instead of corporate Obamacare. Uh, and uh, forgive, and, um, and a jobs program, massive jobs program, especially for people under the age of 25. That would be a minimal rational. But instead, they, the state reacts through force by eradicating the encampments. And that was a kind of window to me into how myopic and blind the state has become. 
because you have to remember that the people who have power no longer live in America. We, you know, there's a New Yorker writer who said they live in Richistan, a whole other country. They never fly commercial airlines. The only, the only working people they ever talk to are like their gardener or their chauffeur. They make obscene amounts of money like this hedge fund, corrupt hedge fund manager, Steve Cohen, was making a billion dollars a year on speculating. In the 17th century, speculation was a crime. Speculators were hung. Here they run the government. And, and so I think that there will be blowback. I think we who care about the poor, the working class, popular, are, have been severely weakened after a century of anti-communist purges, which of course had nothing to do with communism. It had to do with breaking any group, including labor unions, you know, radical press, whatever it was, that challenged those systems of power. It's why you know, there aren't many of us out there because, frankly, it's really hard to make a living because you can't get into an institution. You can't teach anywhere. I, you think I, New York Times would never allow me to write for them anymore. <laughs> and uh, you, you get, you know, they make your life, if you actually get up and speak what you think is the truth, they make your life hell. Yeah. Financially and every other way. I mean, look at Glenn Ford. I mean, Glenn's a great example. Glenn, I think, speaks truth to power. Yes. And look how, or look, you know, what they've done to Glenn, look what they've done to Cornell. I mean, Cornell's vilified on black radio mm -hmm. yes. because they got the whole smoke machine going against Cornell. Yes. He, when was the last time you ever saw Cornell West on MSNBC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, and you never will. The Obama Network. The Obama Network, run by an FBI informant, and as Cornell adds, a pimp. Um, yeah, uh, and, and so when you have voices, if you, when you, and, and you know, I'll just close by saying that the most astute critique of empire in American history has been the black prophetic tradition that comes out of Douglas. Yes. Because, and Tubman and everyone else, yes. Fannie Lou Hamer and every, because blacks, because they've suffered from the oppression of empire internally, understand in a way that th those who have not suffered internally, they understand how empire works. So I, who spent 20 years of my life on the outer reaches of empire, I mean, I had to go see it in places like El Salvador. I got it only because I went to the outer reaches of empire and saw how empire works. And in totalitarian states, what happens is that the mechanisms of control of the outer reaches of empire, which are always violence and coercion, as the society begins to disintegrate, those mechanisms migrate back to the heart of empire. That's what killed ancient Athens. It's what always kills empire. Thucydides writes about that. So, so suddenly, you know, the drones they're using in the Middle East, they're now using here. The militarized, I mean, what's the difference between a night raid in Newark and a night raid in Fallujah? There is none. They're carrying long-barreled weapons. They're wearing Kevlar plates. They got command and control centers. They got armor. There is no difference. And so as all of those forms of control that empire uses on the, on, the, on the outer reaches of empire when the society begins to unravel are brought back and used in empire. And, and so that black, one of the things that has been, I know for Cornell, a very difficult and hard struggle is he's watching uh, a black class embodied by figures like Obama destroy that black prophetic tradition which he has courageously stood up to defend because he, and like Glenn Ford and Larry and others, he understands that, you know, that tradition had a wisdom about centers of power in, in the age of empire that no other intellectual tradition in this country shared. And that's why it was absolutely vital um, and, and why it's so important and why figures like Jeremiah Wright or Cornell West, or others, uh, you know, are so beleaguered because essentially we have seen the resurrection of Booker T. Washington in the form of Barack Obama. That's who he is. He's Booker T. He's Booker T. And 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 Cornell comes out of that tradition of Douglas and W. E. B. Du Bois. Um, and. Uh, and they're frightened. In, in a way, they have to go after figures like Cornell because if his voice is heard, 
and amplified, he exposes them for who they are. And so they must shut him down. Um, and they have been kind of relentless and fierce with him. Uh, and, you know, Cornell, to his credit, you, you don't mess with Cornell West. <laughs> Cornell has just stood up and fought back and paid the price for it. Um, but that black prophetic tradition, which I think Pop, you know, I know you're a secular organization, but I think Pop is kind of twinned with, is absolutely vital um, in a moment of crisis for our own, I'm not just speaking about black people, I'm speaking about all people who are oppressed, our own window and understanding into how systems of power, white supremacy and empire work. Um, and so I salute you all. Uh, I give you the strongest encouragement for everything you do. I am a dues paying member <laughs> of POP, and I always will be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, man. That was a great talk. Thank you.